120 people have died and hundreds more are still missing after the worst flooding in parts of Western Europe for several decades. 30 Eastern time in France, one person died. And at this hour, we're still talking about 1.2 million households. There are road closures and problems for drivers. So we sent things out to Fox 5, Jessica Formoso. We're, we've been driving around the Garden State and right now we're in North Bergen, right off um, West Side. Falling across the area and reports of flooding in the French Quarter right now in Jackson Square. Let's go. A catastrophic storm has slammed into Paris, turning the beloved city of light into a scene of chaos. Streets are flooded, landmarks damaged, and the city is reeling from nature's fury. Amid the ruins, questions arise. Is this a message from above, or is nature getting revenge for humans' harsh treatment? This tale isn't just news. It's a wake-up call, blending raw reality with ancient prophecies of divine wrath. Join us as we explore this mystery as we strive to make sense of the aftermath of this extraordinary storm. Floods washed away, the famous landmark of the Eiffel Tower. Recently, a huge storm hit France and Italy, causing a lot of sadness and damage. Sadly, as many as nine people lost their lives because of this fierce weather event. The world we live in has an amazing power that can create beautiful things, but also cause terrible events like this storm. Indeed, this dreadful weather struck Paris, the famous city known for romance and beauty, which people often call the city of love. This storm was not ordinary. It was really strong and scary. It came with extremely strong winds and a lot of rain, causing lots of problems and harm to the city and the folks living there. Now you might be wondering, how do storms like this even start? Is there a deeper meaning behind them? Paris, known worldwide as an influential and significant city, plays a huge role globally. In terms of size, it was once ranked as the fourth biggest city in the European Union. Also, it's super popular with tourists, coming in second after London as the most visited European city. A fun fact you might not know, Paris is often referred to as a city of light. But why is that? It's because Paris was one of the first cities to have street lighting. However, the city recently faced harsh weather conditions. After experiencing a very hot period, Paris was suddenly hit by intense rains that were quite extreme. These heavy rains came right after the heat, overwhelming the city. Specifically, the rain was so heavy that in just one hour, it was like a whole month's rain had fallen down. There was this reporter who was traveling on a bus in the southern part of Paris when suddenly water started pouring in through the doors reaching the feet of the passengers. Imagine how frightening that must have been. When it rains a lot and there are many storms, some people wonder if it's a message from God. They think about old stories from the Bible, like the one about Adam and Eve. You know, the first two people, according to the Bible, who did something wrong? They ate fruit from a tree they were told to stay away from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This act of not listening led to a lot of problems. The Bible says that doing wrong things, which it calls sin, became a big problem for everyone after that. The results of doing wrong things were really bad, even leading to death. The story continues in the Bible with people getting worse, doing more bad things, which made the world a pretty tough place to live. It got so bad that according to the Bible, God decided to start over and send a huge flood to clean everything up. But even after the flood, people didn't stop doing bad things. It seems like the more time passed, the more clever people got at being bad. There's this part in the Bible where a prophet named Jeremiah talks about how tricky and bad the human heart can be. But there's more to the story. The Bible also talks about a time called the Great Tribulation, which is supposed to be a really tough time unlike any other in history. This is something mentioned a few times in the Bible. The words used to describe this period like the wrath of God or the anger of God make it clear that this tough time is something that comes from God as a response to all the bad things happening. The idea is that God will bring this great tribulation to the world because of all the wrong things people are doing. The words like wrath, anger, storm, and jealousy in the Old Testament all point to this idea of a really tough time that is connected to how God feels about the bad things happening. So when we see a lot of storms or bad weather, some people might think about these stories and wonder if it's a sign of something bigger. They think about how the world has been through tough times before and wonder if it's happening again. It's a big question and makes people think about how they live their lives and the choices they make. In Isaiah chapter 13, verse 13, it says, Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth shake from its place because of the Lord's wrath. This means that God is so powerful that he can make the entire sky and earth move because he is very upset. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 23 to 24, the Bible tells us, look, the Lord's storm is coming. His anger is like a big storm. It will hit hard on the bad people. The Lord won't stop being angry until he does what he wants to do. As time goes on, you will start to understand this. 
This is about a warning that God is sending a huge storm as a sign of his anger. And it's especially meant for those who do wrong. And we're told that eventually everyone will understand why this had to happen. Nahum, chapter one, verse six asks two questions. Who can stand before his wrath? Who can endure the heat of his anger? This means who can possibly hold up or remain standing when God is really angry? It's like saying God's anger is so intense that it's like a big consuming fire, and even rocks break apart because of it. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 8 has God saying, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, for the day I will stand up and take what's mine. I plan to bring together nations and kingdoms to show them my anger, all my hot anger, and because of my jealousy, the whole earth will be caught up in it. Here God is telling us to wait for a day when he will deal with everyone at once using his anger to clean up the earth because of his deep care and concern, which he compares to a fire. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 19, it's written, Look, the Lord's storm is coming. His anger is rolling in like a big storm. It will fall hard on those who are bad. This means a huge storm, showing God's anger, is on its way to strike down those who have been doing wrong things. Lastly, Romans chapter 2 verse 8 says, But for those who only look out for themselves and do not follow the truth, but follow what is wrong, there will be anger and fury. This means that people who are selfish and ignore what is right, choosing instead to do bad things, will face God's intense anger. Now we connect old stories to what's happening today. See how past and present mix, from unforgettable pain to redemption. In the Bible, especially in stories about the Israelites, we notice a repeating theme. Whenever the Israelites did something they shouldn't, God was not pleased, and they ended up facing tough situations. This happened because God is the definition of good and right. That's what it means to be holy. When anyone does something wrong, especially when they know what the right thing to do is, it's like they're going against what God stands for. God loves fairness and hates it when people are treated badly or when they do wrong things. This reaction from God is shown in many stories across the Bible, like in the books of Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Kings, Ezra, and Nehemiah. However, when we talk about God's wrath, it doesn't just refer to how he reacted to the Israelites' mistakes back then. It also hints at something bigger, a future event that's more significant than any other known as the wrath of the last days. John the Baptist spoke about this when he was baptizing folks, including some religious leaders known as the Pharisees and Sadducees. He didn't mince words. He called them a bunch of snakes and asked them who had tipped them off about the coming wrath. This is found in Luke chapter 3, verse 7. Essentially, John was alerting them to a big trouble on the horizon and advising them to alter their behavior. This idea of God's wrath is not just about punishment for bad actions. It's more about setting things right. When people stray from what's good, honest, and just, it disturbs the balance of things. In the stories of the Israelites, when they made mistakes, it was not just about them doing wrong. It was about them moving away from a life that was good and balanced. God's reactions were attempts to guide them back, to help them understand the difference between right and wrong, and to encourage a return to living in a way that reflects goodness and justice. The concept of this ultimate wrath is brought up in the New Testament a lot, especially because those writings came during a time called the period of grace. This was a time when the message was all about kindness and forgiveness through faith. Even though the Bible mentions God's wrath quite a bit, it's usually talking about these two different kinds, the everyday consequences for bad actions, and then the big final wrath that's still to come. So how can we stay clear of this big final wrath, often referred to as the Great Tribulation? The Bible presents a clear way out by having faith in Jesus. It's said that believing in Jesus is not just something nice. It's actually the way to be saved right now. This belief is so powerful that if someone believes in Jesus and they're still around when he comes back, they're going to go through an amazing change. Their body will transform and they'll be taken away from all the trouble of this world to be with God forever as mentioned in 1 Thessalonians. By trusting in Jesus, the Bible says, we can avoid the worst of God's anger the kind that's reserved for the final days. It's like getting a pass away from the biggest storm ever. Believing in Jesus, then, is not just a one-time thing. It's a lifelong journey that keeps you safe from the ultimate troubles that are predicted to come. This faith is supposed to give hope and a promise of being protected from the future, big troubles, or wrath. These are really important promises for anyone who believes in Jesus. The idea is that God didn't make us face scary things or punishment, 
but to be saved through Jesus Christ. Think about it like this. Even when we were making a lot of mistakes and not thinking about God, he still sent Jesus to help us out. That's a big deal because it shows just how much God loves us. Jesus' sacrifice dying for us is a way to make things right between us and God. Now that we're on good terms with God because of what Jesus did, we're in a really good spot. In other words, Jesus is like a hero saving those who trust in him from the biggest trouble ever, which some people call the Great Tribulation. Now, if someone decides not to accept what Jesus offers, it gets a bit complicated. Here's what happens in two different scenarios. If someone passes away before Jesus comes back to gather all the believers, that person won't get to live forever in happiness. Instead, they stay under what's called God's wrath. It's like missing out on the biggest rescue mission ever. Then there's a part in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, that talks about a deal that will last for a short time, and in the middle of that time, things will start to go wrong. The good times, the celebrations, and the offerings will stop. Then something really bad, described as the destroyer with hideous wings, will come and cause a lot of trouble until the very end of time, which has already been decided. So what all this means is that believing in Jesus is more than just a good choice. It's a life-saving one. It's like being given the best safety gear for the scariest storm. And for those who decide not to go with Jesus, they miss out on this protection and have to face some pretty tough times. It's a big decision with big consequences. The idea here is to not just think about today, but about the long term, about what happens after this life and how decisions now can affect that. Next, we look at the times that have shaped what we believe. We'll see how old predictions fit with what's going on now. The calm before the extreme storm. In the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, there's a big plan outlined that spans 70 weeks, but these aren't just any weeks. Each week represents seven years. So when we talk about 70 weeks, we're really talking about 490 years. Now, the first part of this plan covers 69 of those weeks, or 483 years. This starts from a very specific point in history, when a king named Artaxerxes told the Jewish people they could rebuild the walls around their city, Jerusalem. This happened around 445 BC. Fast forward through time, and these 483 years stretch all the way to a very important moment when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, which was around 32 AD. Right after those 69 weeks were up, some big things happened. Jesus was betrayed and handed over to the Roman authorities by some of the Jewish leaders. They didn't realize it, but their actions were actually fulfilling what had been predicted. Jesus' death wasn't just a sad ending. It marked a huge shift from one era to another, from what's known as the period of the law to a new time called the period of grace. This period of grace is like a big pause before the final 70th week kicks off. We're living in that pause right now. It's a special time when people can get to know God and receive his kindness. This grace period will end when Jesus returns to take those who believe in him out of this world. That event will start the last part of the plan, the 70th week, which will be a really tough time known as the Great Tribulation. Now, talking about God can be really nice, especially when we focus on the amazing ways he helps and saves people. But when the conversation shifts to how he judges or corrects, a lot of people get uncomfortable or start to drift away. They might start to think of God in their own way, sort of making him out to be what they want instead of understanding him as he really is. It's important, though, to not just focus on the nice parts, but to understand the whole picture. Isaiah 65 is a chapter in the Bible where this balance is shown really well. It's like a message passed down through the ages, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it talks about both sides, how God will judge, but also how he will save. This chapter doesn't just give warnings, it also gives hope. In Isaiah chapter 65, verse 1, the message is pretty straightforward. I showed myself to people who weren't even asking for me. I was found by those who weren't looking for me. I kept saying, here I am, here I am, to a group of people who didn't bother calling out my name. I've spent all day ready to greet people who don't listen and just go their own way. People who come up with their own ideas and make me upset all the time. This part of the Bible is saying that God is always there reaching out to people even if they aren't looking for him or know that they need him. He's like someone waving his hands trying to get your attention because he wants to help. But instead, people are too caught up in their own stuff, walking on paths that just lead them away from him. They're stuck in their own world, doing things that only push God away, even though he's right there saying, look, here I am. Now, some might quickly say, but hey, that's just Old Testament stuff. Thinking that the God talked about there isn't the same as the one in the New Testament. 
But that's not right. God doesn't change. The only thing that's new is how we get to know him, which in the New Testament is through Jesus and the help of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, this same idea comes up. For example, in Isaiah chapter 64, Isaiah is kind of asking God a big question, similar to questions people ask Jesus. Isaiah says, you help those who happily do the right thing and remember your ways. But we kept messing up, doing the wrong things, and you got mad. So how can we ever hope to be saved? Then, moving to Isaiah chapter 65, we hear the same kind of message that Jesus shared in Luke chapter 13, verse 24. There, someone asked Jesus, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And Jesus, who's giving his answer with the same spirit that guided Isaiah, talks about judgment, but also about how to be saved. He's saying, pay attention to what God is telling you and make sure to take the right path. This is like advising someone to choose the less popular, narrower gate over the wide one that many people go through without thinking. He's emphasizing that a lot of people will try to get in, but can't because they didn't choose the correct path. So what we're seeing here is a continuous message through the Bible. God's open invitation to everyone, the consistent need for people to choose the right way, and the clear guidance provided by Jesus. Discover the real meaning behind being punished or saved as we match old stories to what's happening around us. God's words versus our own selfish wishes. At the start of Isaiah chapter 65, there's a story about God's feelings towards the Israelites, his people who were chosen to lead by example. God is like someone who keeps reaching out to help people who are lost. But these people, the Israelites, just won't listen. They're really stubborn, sticking to their own ways and not paying any attention to God. Imagine a parent trying to guide a child away from danger, but the child keeps walking towards it. That's how God felt. He tried so hard to show them the right path teaching them through many prophets he sent their way. But no matter how much guidance he gave, they turned their backs, preferring to follow their own ideas instead of his. This same message is echoed by Paul in the New Testament when he talks about some of the Jewish people of his time in his letter to the Romans. Here God describes them as wandering off the right path, lost in their own thoughts and fantasies. But it's not that God is against all imagination. In fact, he's the one who gave us the ability to imagine and create. He wants us to use our imagination for good things, to make our lives and the lives of others better, to come up with ideas that help everyone and bring glory to Him. Think about it like using tools to build a shelter or invent something new that helps people. Our creativity is meant to enrich our world and reflect the goodness and innovation God has placed in us. However, there's a part of imagination that many people forget about. And that's understanding God and how to show Him respect and love in the way we live. We have been taught about God and how to connect with Him, especially through the teachings and guidance of the Holy Spirit. The truth about God and how we should live is all there in the Bible. We shouldn't make up our own rules or twist God's words to fit what we want or what's convenient for us. God's message is clear. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Living in a way that ignores God's guidance and just follows our own whims is described vividly in Isaiah. He compares it to smoke that irritates the nose. It's annoying and unpleasant. God is saying that when people live like this, ignoring his words and following their own selfish desires, it's as irritating to him as smoke is to us. Personally, I don't want to be the reason God feels this discomfort. I wouldn't want anyone else to be that reason either. It's about making choices that don't just look good for us, but are in line with what's genuinely good, as shown by God, avoiding actions and thoughts that would cause him distress or annoyance. The same experiences that happened to Isaiah, Paul, Jesus, and all who followed him happened to me too. Isaiah 65 talks about more situations where God had to step in and set things right for Israel, his chosen people. Let's look at what Isaiah chapter 65 verse 11 says. It's like God is saying, For those who decide to ignore me, who forget about the sacred place I love, and instead decide to celebrate luck and fortune in their own way, pouring out wine as if deciding their own fates, well, I have to take action against them. I tried reaching out. I called out, but nobody listened. They ignored me. Instead of doing what's right, they did what I hate and chose things that I don't like at all. This is really important because it shows that turning away from God, not listening to His guidance and following our own desires can lead to serious problems. My holy mountain isn't just a place, it's about being with God, living in a way that honors His truth and His spirit. In today's world, it's not about the physical place where you worship, but it's about whether your heart is in the right place, whether you're following God's truth and living by His spirit. 
Jesus explained this really well when he was talking to a woman, as recorded in the Bible. He told her, look, it's not about where you worship, whether it's on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans don't really understand what you're worshiping, but we do, and it's about something much deeper. But the time is coming, actually it's already here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. That's the kind of worshiper God is looking for. To truly worship, it has to be in spirit and truth. What Jesus meant is that the place isn't important. What's important is how you worship and the truth you're living by. God is looking for people who worship with their whole heart, guided by His truth and moved by His spirit, not just following rituals or traditions without understanding or feeling. It's about having a real heartfelt connection with God, understanding who He is, and living in a way that reflects that understanding. This kind of worship isn't limited to a specific place or time. It's about how we live our lives every day, guided by God's truth and filled with His Spirit. Think about the signs and choices in our lives. What do they tell us about where we're headed? Who decides who gets saved and who doesn't? Let's talk about setting the table for luck, a concept that many people embrace. It's common to see people showing off what they have, from the food on their tables to the fancy things they own. They seem to say, look how lucky I am with all these things. Follow what I do and you can be just as lucky. But this way of thinking and acting isn't what God asks from us. Instead of flaunting our luck or wealth, we're supposed to set our tables as a sign of thankfulness and as an invitation to share what we have with others. It's not about luck, it's about gratitude and generosity. Now let's think about the part where it talks about mixing wine, an action attributed to someone named Duane in this scenario, but symbolizing something deeper. In the Bible, Jesus uses the mixing of different wines as a metaphor. People say mixing red and white wine isn't a great idea. They don't go well together, sort of like trying to mix new ideas with old ones that don't fit. Jesus uses this to illustrate a larger point about God's agreements with humanity, what we call covenants. The old agreements, or old covenant, were based on strict laws and rituals from ancient times. But then came Jesus, introducing a new covenant based on faith, love, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. This is like saying you can't just mix the old ways with the new hopes and guidance from the Spirit and expect them to blend smoothly without understanding their true essence. Following the Spirit means living a life that aligns with Jesus' teachings, carrying one's own cross daily. It's about living in a way that shows we're trying to fulfill God's desires for us, not just sticking rigidly to old rules or combining them randomly with new beliefs without true understanding. Another idea he shared is that our human nature doesn't blend well with God's Spirit. He tells us that we need to let go of our selfish desires to let God's Spirit really work in us. He uses the example of darkness and light, not mixing, to show how God's way and Satan's way can't fit together. They're complete opposites. Just like light chases away darkness, God's ways push away the bad things. He also talks about how following the world's ideas doesn't match up with following God's ideas. It's like trying to fit two puzzle pieces together that don't belong. The same goes for trying to blend human ideas of wisdom with God's wisdom. They just don't mix well because human ideas often ignore God's bigger picture. He's urging us to focus only on Him and His path for our lives. If we don't, we'll face consequences shown in the outcomes of our lives and ultimately our souls, as mentioned in Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. This isn't about scaring us, but more about guiding us to avoid things that could hurt us in the long run. Talking about the outer court of the temple, mentioned in the same part of Revelation, he's making a point about understanding what is sacred and what is not. The outer court was left for non-believers, and this separation symbolizes how some things are meant to be set apart for God. It's about recognizing what should be cherished and what should be left out. When he says the Gentiles will trample the holy city for 42 months, it's a symbolic way of saying there will be difficult times, but these are part of God's larger plan of judgment and salvation. This isn't meant to make our lives miserable. Rather, it's a way to protect us from greater harm, guiding us toward salvation. The question who will be saved seems like it's tough, but actually the answer is pretty simple. God has given us all the clues and help we need to figure this out. It's like he has laid out a clear path for us to follow, providing us with all the guidance through his Holy Spirit. This isn't new, just as he was there guiding his chosen people in the past, he's here for us now, giving us what we need to understand and follow him. This guidance isn't just about knowing right from wrong, it's also about feeling His presence and direction in our lives, like a compass pointing us the right way. The Holy Spirit acts like a teacher or a guide, showing us how to live and bringing us closer to God.
The area mentioned between the central mountains of Palestine and the Mediterranean Sea, north of Joppa, is used as an illustration in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. It's like pointing out a specific place on a map to help us understand where things happened or will happen. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, there's a warning about someone who will say bad things about God and will try to hurt God's people. This person will even try to change important rules and times. Even in this scary prediction, there's a note of hope. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. This might sound confusing, but it's actually a way of saying that even though there will be hard times, they won't last forever. It's like telling us that there's a tough winter coming, but it will definitely turn to spring. So when we ask who will be saved, the answer is those who stay close to God, who listen to his guidance and stay strong, even when things get tough. It's for those who don't just want to be saved, but choose to trust and follow God's path laid out for us. It's about keeping faith even when faced with challenges or when someone tries to lead us astray. Has nature's rage in Paris truly unveiled a divine message or is it merely a reminder of our planet's fragile balance? Share your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more insights and updates.